Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're a show that broadcasts every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 uh, 2 to 2 in the downtown studios of Think Tech Hawaii. We focus on success stories in Hawaii about businesses. Uh, we've heard all the negativity. We've heard about how challenging it is to do business in Hawaii with the taxes and regulations and so forth and the high costs. Uh, but there are companies that have made a success of it. They are figuring out how to make it work. And we are a show that highlights those success stories. Uh, we also highlight individuals from time to time uh, that have made an impact on Hawaii and continue to do so. Uh, today is going to be one of those shows. I've got Dr. Walton Shim here who has a very distinguished career at the University of Hawaii Medical School uh, and has decided at, at I think age 80 something decided to, to actually start a new business and get started in a, a different direction and we're here to talk a little bit about that today but uh, Dr. Shim welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now you've been in Hawaii a, a long time. Were you born here? I was born here uh, 87 years ago. 87 years ago. As of two days ago. Oh, by the well way. happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so you uh, so you were born here, uh, raised here. Where did you uh, go to school? Well, I went to Iolani, and after Iolani, I um, attended Dartmouth, Dartmouth College wow. in New Hampshire. Yeah, far, far away. Yeah, cold country. Very cold. Uh, actually, it was very nice there. I think one of the reasons I got in is because their leading question on their uh, application was, why do you want to go to Dartmouth? And I said, because it's far away from home. <laughs> I got my wish. Well, you did, uh, and apparently you did very well there. And uh, what was at that part uh, at that time? What was your major at Dartmouth? My major was uh, one of uh, pre-med. Uh, I was enrolled in a three-year college program, and doubled my first year of medicine with my last year of college, so that the fourth year was a combination of uh, first year medicine and last year of college. So wow. I got a degree on an AB degree and uh, got through. Uh, two years of medical school. At that time, Dartmouth was just a two-year school, and I transferred to Columbia and finished my uh, degree at Columbia. So you knew at an early age that you wanted to go into medicine. Yes, uh, rather early, yeah. right. <laughs> what, what convinced you? Does that run in the family, or? No, not really. As a matter of fact, I think I was the weak link in the chain. <laughs> my um, great-grandfather was an Episcopal priest, and he started the uh, church in St. John's Kula, the Episcopal mm. Church. My father was an um, Episcopal priest, and uh, he was a pastor at uh, St. Elizabeth's here in Honolulu. My uncle, uh, Waisang Mark, was also a wow. priest at um, St. Peter's uh, right on Emma Street. So I come from a long line of ministers, and I was the only one who became a doctor, so I always say I was the weak link there. Well, was that something that they were happy with, or did they expect you to follow in their footsteps? Well, I don't think that I uh, can say that they were happy with it, but I don't think they were unhappy about it. Um, the reason I chose medicine is um, I thought that my interests were in line with those of a, uh, of a physician. In other words, I was interested in science and biology and physics and mathematics more than I was with uh, history and uh, theology and religion. Well, I guess in a sense, though, uh, both professions are healers. You know, one heals uh, you know, the, the emotion and, and the psychology, and the other one heals the body. I think that's a good way of looking at it, and uh, I, I think that uh, medicine should have a lot of uh, you know, of personal contact and of uh, interest in people's mm -hmm. well-being, not only with their physical illnesses. So I think that's uh, that's a good point. That's very good. Uh, and so after um, you went to Columbia, that's where you finished med school. Yes, right. And did you stay in the, on the East Coast? Or? I stayed on the East Coast. I um, attended. Um, Cornell for my internship or residency. Oh, you got some real pedigree colleges there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought since I was in New York, I'd sort of like to stay there. And uh, I enjoyed New York. I thought it's a wonderful city. And then after um, uh, my uh, surgical uh, residency, I spent two years in the Army down in Edgewood Arsenal in uh, Maryland. Had a nice time there because it's a beautiful country. Did a lot of uh, attending of uh, auctions and uh, various uh, 
uh, farm-related farm things. Really? I, it, is that an ammunition depot or? Yeah, no, that's, um, that is a research uh, okay. organization. Edgewood Arsenal is a researcher. What, that, what they were interested in that time was uh, research in uh, psychedelic things like LSD. Uh -huh. oh, and um, times. also in production of nerve gases and stuff like that. Uh, wow. I think the Arsenal is, um, uh, I forget the name of it, but it's about five miles away. That was a place where uh, okay. I think WikiLeaks yeah. started. Mm. Uh, then after two years in the Army, I um, went to um, Northwestern at the Children's Memorial Hospital to do my pediatric surgery uh, uh, residency. All right, and how long were you there for that? I was there for two, a year and a half. Okay, right? and it's, um, and did that, did that bring you back home afterwards? Yes, or? I came back in 1967, and um, set up practice there and became uh, uh, part of the university's teaching program on their faculty. But I was mainly, uh, I was part-time faculty and part-time private practice in pediatric surgery. Ah, and where was the private practice based in? That was, uh, I had an office at um, Koheka Street, the Professional Center Building. And for the longest time until they built the new Capilani uh, Medical Center for Women and Children, I, I had a private, private office there, and then when they had the office building built at uh, KMC WC, then I had an office in the tower there. Oh, okay. So in the physician's building, the POV. Yes. Oh, yeah. Right. That's good. We, um, all three of my boys were born there. I was born there, too. <laughs> Not in the physician's building, but in <laughs> yeah, but, the other place. <laughs> that's at Capilani Maternity Home. Right. Well, that, I, I don't know where it's at now, but I remember that uh, it was in the basement before. Uh, yes, you know, there was a, th a two or three story small building on Bingham Street, mm -hmm. and that used to be the uh, area where the maternity hospital was. Oh. And I was born there, and my office at the tower was about 200 feet away from there. Wow. So I made a grand wow. circle from. Exactly, it's uh, from, the circle of life. You came right, right back again. Very good. And so you, um, you, were, you were practicing, and then you also were teaching at the medical school. And yes. how long were you doing that? Well, I was part of the medical school ever since I got back, and I practiced for 47 years uh, wow. before retiring. I still have my appointment uh, as a uh, professor of uh, surgery and pediatrics at the medical school, and it's under the auspices of the medical school uh, that I um, uh, develop smart tummy, which is what we're sort of here to right. talk about today. Right, right. And so it was from all these years of experience, it kind of led you to the concept of smart tummy. But just out of curiosity, I mean, you any idea at all how many surgeries you performed? You know, it's a wild guess because I've never counted them, but I imagine it, it must be in the area of thousands over uh, 47, 47 years. years. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, it's through my uh, practice in the treating children and doing and realizing the importance of uh, physical examination that I came upon the idea that we need a great deal of education. At least pre-medical students or medical students need a very good education in physical diagnosis. And that's how I sort of stumbled on the idea of creating a mannequin to teach medical students and young doctors. And so that's where we're, we're going to be entering into now in today's discussion is that after 47 year career uh, and having performed thousands of surgeries, you're now in a position where you want to, you know where there's, there's a need for improvement and where things can be made a little bit better and, um, and I guess allow for uh, more development in the skills of the, the, the current surgeons. Yes, you're right. You know, one of the very important things to realize is that over the course of a century or two centuries that medicine has existed in its present state of, uh, of uh, being beyond the shaman or, or um, magicians, that we've taken on a more scientific uh, role in, in medicine and it's based on evidence and on physiology and on anatomy. And in this setting, uh, say a century ago, most teaching was done on a 
indigent patient mm. basis. And medical schools in Europe and the United States used indigent patients in Baltimore and New York and Philadelphia to teach upcoming generations of physicians. And these patients who were not able to pay for themselves were used as teaching tools for, for um, medical students. Well, I think that as we've progressed, these indigent patients have become less and less available to us. First of all, I think we don't have very many, quote, indigent patients anymore. They're all covered by insurance. They're private patients, and private patients have their choice as to whom they want to be exposed to. And I think many of them don't want to be used as patient guinea pigs, so to speak. And uh, so I think this has deprived medical students of the ability to see firsthand how sickness is diagnosed and treated. And so I think because of this, we need to substitute a living human being with a simulator. And I think that's where mannequins have come into the, into the, into the fore. Uh, in well, absolutely. It just makes all the sense in the world because as the population re gets reduced that are willing to be, you know, practiced on, if right. you will, um, that we need to replace that with somebody. So we, or something, so we have to have, you know, I, I guess a, a mannequin that can replicate what a body would do and how it would feel and, and for different ailments. You're absolutely um, right. To practice and, and get good at right. what you're doing. It's not only a matter of availability for teaching purposes, but it's also a matter of safety. If you remove the patient, the indigent patient, as an example of a, a teaching tool for teaching, let's say, the diagnosis of acute appendicitis or perforated ulcer, then you've got to substitute something for that. Otherwise, a young doctor goes into the field without any previous experience of how to make a diagnosis of acute gallbladder disease or perforated ulcer or some acute problem. And so it's a matter of patient safety. It's, it's a very good point. Um, we need to go on a short break. And then when we come back, maybe we can go into a, a deep dive a little bit into the smart tummy concept and, and how you came up with it and how it works and that sort of thing. Sure. All right. But this is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. I'm here with Dr. Walter Shim, uh, Walton Shim. And we are talking about uh, after 47 years uh, career in uh, University of Hawaii Medical School, he's decided to create this new mannequin. And we're going to be talking about that here shortly. We'll be right back. Howard Wig, I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on ThinkTech Hawaii. We show at three o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists, both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Welcome back. This is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're here today with Dr. Shim. We're talking a little bit about um, a mannequin that can be used uh, to help teach uh, and provide some experience for some surgeons or surgeon wannabes uh, so that they can uh, be a little bit more comfortable with their skill set. And uh, Dr. Shim, thank you for um, being on the show today, bringing this down to as much of a layman level as, as possible. Um, after all these years of experience, you've seen a lot of things, you've taught at the university, you know what the teaching is like, and so you've come up with this concept of smart tummy, which is really a mannequin. Now from there, explain, you know, why, why are you coming up with this concept? Are you, um, thanks, Reg. Well, as you know, um, one of the most common uh, 
surgical problems or emergencies is appendicitis or acute appendicitis in both children and adults. And if you think about how this is, how the diagnosis is made, is made mainly on palpation or the feeling of the belly. Uh, apart from the history that the patient complains of pain, you put your hand on the belly to see where it's tender, where it's firm or hard, and to try to create a mannequin that will replicate this uh, is, a, is, a, is something that I try to do, because this is the most basic problem or most basic concept in physical diagnosis, the feeling of the belly or the abdomen. And how do you replicate this in a, in a mannequin or a dummy? Well, you have to have a belly wall that's fairly soft, and if you want an example of that, you can feel your own abdomen. Oh, definitely. So. Yeah, well, <laughs> and that's fairly soft. So what's the difference between that and an acute appendicitis? Well, the acute appendicitis causes a hard stiffness or a lump mm -hmm. in the right lower quadrant. And to make this, in, uh, to, to portray this in a mannequin is what we tried to do. So what I've done, or the origin of my, um, of my uh, mannequin, was to create a mannequin of several inflatables, let's say 100 to 150 inflatable balloons that could be distended or made firm by infusing them with air in certain areas of the belly. So let's say we want to, we'll take the balloons in the right lower quadrant and, and there could be a lot of balloons, a yeah, lot of little balloons. A lot of in little that balloons, area. that's yeah. right, controlled by a, um, a uh, compressor and a, a, mo and a, a manifold. manifold yeah. Right. And so in designing this, you want to inflate certain balloons in certain areas to, to simulate appendicitis mm -hmm. or a distended bladder or an, a, a gallbladder or distend all of them, make them firm for the entire Would a belly. hernia be included in that? A hernia would be one, but in starting this, you have to sort of limit yourself. Mm. You, you can't be make everything mm. uh, from the start. So we've decided to do four things. Penicitis, gallbladder disease, a distended bladder, such as you would see in a pregnant woman, and general peritonitis, which would be from a perforated ulcer. Now, how do we go about this? Well, I thought, I got my idea from talking to my organ repairman at St. Clement's Church. Okay, so the, the organ that you play That's and make right. music with. Okay. That's right, my pipe organ repair <laughs> person, okay. right. And the way the air is controlled is that you have a compressor, and when you depress a key on the keyboard, it allows air to go to a certain pipe. Mm. And if you press another key, it goes to another pipe and you get a difference in pitch. Now, if we could create that to give you inflation of certain balloons in certain areas of the belly, it would be similar to the pipe organ and its mm -hmm. distribution of air. So what we've done is gone ahead with two, other, with two engineers at the School of Engineering, and I uh, told them about this idea, and we decided that, you know, maybe we could create something like this with a manifold, a pump, a compressor, and these balloons to represent the pipes in the organ. And so with this, we went on and patented this idea of, um, of uh, inflating certain So you balloons. actually have a patent on this? Yes, we uh, have four patents, as a matter of wow. fact. So that's a great advantage, and the nice thing about it is that this was all done under the auspices of PACE in the Pacific mm -hmm. area uh, uh, for entrepreneurship. Uh, right, right, right. And um, uh, we won the first prize uh, of this in 2014 for this, in this competition. And this went on then to uh, spur us to further development of this, which we are now undertaking with uh, a manufacturing company. Right, and then uh, the manufacturing company is is local, or is it on the mainland, or it's it's on the mainland. We uh, explored all sorts of manufacturing company manufacturing companies, and we happened to meet this at a trade meet these people. It's called One World um, uh, Design and Manufacturing Group, or One World DMG, which is located in Warren, New Jersey, and so we're working with them now to produce this prototype mannequin. And hopefully, it'll turn into a real product that can be used by a uh, thousand or so medical schools, nursing schools, that's just in the United States only, 
but it can be applied worldwide to other institutions that need to be need to have this teaching process. You know, it sounds like there's a, a huge opportunity here, um, you know, for people to, to integrate this concept into their teacher and certification programs and maybe even continuing education to some degree. Um, but I mean, is there anybody else doing this in this way that you're describing? That's a good question. And the surprising answer to that is no. And to me, it's almost unbelievable that among the great number of mannequins that exist, none of them really look and feel like human beings. For instance, most mannequins are made out of plastic. They're hard, they're cold, and they are only for inserting diagnostic instruments. So not very realistic. That's right, not very realistic. Whereas the mannequin that we're trying to create will, will attempt to, to uh, simulate the human belly, which is compressible, mm. and also uh, to simulate uh, different conditions that can be mm. changed by the pressing of a key on it's a computer. It's got to be difficult to do because the skin itself is multiple layers That's thick, right. and then you've got the organs that, and, and with the different type of issues that you might be You're experiencing. Right. You're right. That's a, it's a very difficult concept, but if you know where you want to go, there's a hope that you can get there. The problem in the past is I think that people who needed to have these diagnostic tools were not the ones who created the mannequins. It was the mannequin manufacturers who didn't have the idea of what they were looking for, they, and there was no, not the synthesis. Whereas I think that now we've got uh, a clinician, uh, myself, and our engineers, in communicating with the manufacturer to see if we can bridge this gap between what yeah. we really want to create and the possibilities of creating it. So what I'm hearing is that there's a lot more collaboration going yes. on now to try to get a product that actually is going to be a positive. You're actually you're, you're very you're quite correct in the in using the word collaboration because I think what I've learned in the past six years of being involved in this project is that you can't do it alone. Mm. An idea does not turn into a product, and a good uh, uh, example of that is that only two percent of patents get manufactured, wow. which is a very small percentage. It is. Even though you've got the patent, which is the idea, turning it into a saleable product is not guaranteed. Well, the conversion process of going from patent to monetization is where things start to get a little complicated. Yes. But the fact that you've got four patents for this indicate that it's it's unique. It's, it's Nobody else has got something like this, otherwise you wouldn't have been able to get the patent. Right. That's right, but that's only dealing with the idea. So now what you've got to do is convince people that the idea has merit mm. and it's worth investing money into it to create a good product. And I think that's the, that's the key to collaboration. Right, well you've also got to, sometimes you've got to educate the people, particularly if there's nothing out there already. Yes. The potential end users of this have to be educated about the product itself, that it even exists. That's a very good point, and I think it's uh, it's part of this show or this process that we're engaged in now to tell people that this is a a very good concept, right? To get the word out. Yes, yeah. and I guess that's um, you know one of the functions of going to trade shows is to help promote and educate the the, the people that have an interest uh, about the concept and how well it works. Um, you know, when does that phase begin? You've been in the, the research and development side, you've got the patents, you're, you're working on the mannequin and the prototype, and, and, and things sound like they're starting to come together. When do you get to the point where you say, okay, now I've got a product that I'm ready to start educating people on, and, um, and then you get the order pad out and start taking the orders? Yes, we've not mentioned one area that is also very important, that is one of finance. Because in order to, to promote something to be saleable, you need capital. capital. Of course. Yeah. And you can't get venture capitalists involved in it unless they see that this is a worthy project or a worthy product and are willing to put some money behind it. So we're in the process of trying to do that, and the, and the mechanism we're using is the federal government. So we are applying for an SBIR grant through the NIH and hope to get 
somewhere in the area of a million or a million and a half dollars in order to fund the development of this through the through the manufacturing company that we're working with. Then you'll have something tangible that you can go out and yes. show how it works. Yes, but then uh, before that, now you've got to convince the NIH that this is a worthy product. <laughs> so anyway, you've got to either convince private enterprise or venture capitalists, which is a little bit difficult to do because they don't see that as, a, as something as important as maybe a new energy drink. I mean, they see mm -hmm. more value in an energy it's drink. more of a longer term investment That's for right. Them. This, is a, this is a more basic problem that mm -hmm. nobody's convinced of yet. And so I think the federal government, through the NIH, has this kind of vision. And I hope to maybe be able to get this grant in order to produce the product. Very good. Well, I, I wish you all the best in the world, and, and it's a fantastic concept. It's something that uh, I'm surprised nobody has really thought of before. And well, you know, until the paperclip was uh, invented, I guess nobody thought about that either. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are wrapping up. I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to come down and talk to us today. Well, thank you very much. Um, You're very kind to say that. And uh, I'm looking forward to maybe in six months you can bring a mannequin to the show and show us how it works. I think that's a wonderful idea. It had not dawned on me but until now, but I think that's a great idea. Six months from now, we'll see you at this All table right. here. All right. You heard it here, folks. Uh, this is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. We highlight individuals and businesses that have uh, success and have figured out how to make it work here in Hawaii. So hopefully I'll see you next week. Until then, aloha.